I like to start with a traditional land acknowledgement uh, for the Chiotake, known, also known as Montreal. As we said about the work of decolonizing and dismantling racism in our universities, I acknowledge that McGill and I are located on unceded indigenous lands. That means that this land has con con this land has and continues to be occupied by settlers without the permission of its indigenous stewards. The Kainan-Kiake Nation is recognized as the custodians of this lands, of the lands and waters where I have the privilege of living and studying, which has also been a meeting place for many First Nations, including members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Before we begin, I'd also like to uh, ask everyone present on Zoom to make sure that you mute your microphones. So welcome, bienvenue, everyone, to this symposium on orchestration research co-hosted by ACTOR, the Analysis, Creation, and Teaching of Orchestration Project, and Kermit, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music, Media, and Technology. This is a hybrid event in, with in-person presentations and attendees, as well as Zoom participation. We're going to have four papers today with uh, short question and answer periods after each paper, which we're gonna limit to about five minutes a piece. And then after, at the conclusion, after all four papers, we're going to have a longer discussion uh, session. If you have questions, if you're on Zoom, I encourage you to type your questions in as you think of them, and we can come back to them later on. Uh, if we don't have time for them in the initial five minute discussion point, please keep typing them into the chat we will refer back to them when we get to the discussion at uh, the conclusion of the papers. I'd like to be the first here to thank all the organizers um, from uh, ACTOR. We've got Stephen McAdams, director, Robert Hasegawa, associate director, Andre Martins de Oliveira, project coordinator, and from Kermit, Fabrice Marandola, director, and Leslie Friesen, events coordinator. Um, I'd also like to thank our Zoom monitor, Lindsay Remore, and our tech producers, Kit Soden and Yuval Adler. So without further ado, we're gonna move on to our paper presentations. Our first paper, Composer Performer Orchestration Research Ensembles is by Stephen McAdams, Elliot Britton, Keith Hamill, Roger Reynolds, and Carolyn Traub. Stephen McAdams is professor of music at McGill University, director of the Music Perception and Cognition Lab, and director of the Actor Partnership. His work brings psychoacoustics and cognitive psychology to bear on the complex issues of orchestration analysis, with the long-term aim of developing a theory of orchestration in collaboration with composers, theorists, and acousticians. He is the author of numerous significant contributions at an international level to the literature on musical timbre perception and auditory grouping and the application to orchestration per perception. Elliot Britton is assistant professor at the University of Toronto, cross-appointed between music technology and composition. He is working on uh, the opening of a new research center for brain performance and music, uh, create music creation, as well as renovation and relaunching of U of T's historic electronic music studios. Recent awards include Connaught Emerging Research Scholar Award, Canadian Foundation for Innovation Grant, and two consecutive DORA awards for best composition and sound design. Keith Hamill is prof professor of music at the University of British Columbia. He is an associate researcher at the Institute for Computing, Information, and Cognitive Systems, a researcher at the Media Graphics Interdisciplinary Center, and director of the UBC Computer Music Studio. He is author of the NoteAbility Pro software program, which is used around the world for professional music engraving and publishing. And he has developed interactive environments for the live performer and computer interaction. Roger Reynolds is professor of music at the University of California, San Diego. 1989, he won the Pulitzer Prize in music for string orchestra composition, Whispers Out of Time. He is author of numerous books and articles, some resulting from collaborations with American, Canadian, and French scientists. The Library of Congress established a special collection of his, and his scores and correspondence are held by the Paul Zocker Institute in Basel. Caroline Traub is Associate Professor of Music at the University of Montreal. She works at the intersection of acoustics and performance studies, drawing on fields as diverse as musical acoustics, psychoacoustics, and music technology. She leads the Laboratoire Informatique, Acoustique, and Musique, and the Laboratoire de Recherche sur le Geste Musicien, a research center for the study of musicians' gestures for biomechanical, acoustic, and perceptual perspectives. So I'd like to welcome Stephen McAdams. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, it's a great pleasure to present uh, to the actor and Kermit communities this work on the core project 
which was developed within the Actor Partnership and which we initially presented at the Nova Contemporary Music Meeting last May. Um, I'll present an overview of the project uh, conducted with partners at UBC, UCSD, University of Montreal, and uh, not Université de Montreal, which is has a, <laughs> and the University of Toronto. And then my colleagues Yuval Adler, Joshua Rosner, and Bob Hasegawa will discuss analysis of scores and recordings uh, from McGill. And Karin Trobe, Justine Maya, Lindsay Rimor, and myself will discuss analysis of interview transcriptions. And Eliezer Kramer will present his experience as a composer in this whole adventure. Okay, that's better. Uh, the ACTA partnership with about 140 regular and student members in 10 countries uh, proposes to enhance attention to timbre and orchestration by bringing its musical use to the forefront of scholarship, practice, and public awareness with world-class artists, humanists, scientists, and engineers. This partnership links North American, European, and East Asian orchestration practice and pedagogy and stimulates the development of new creativity enhancing digital tools for learning, creating and studying orchestration practice in a variety of musics, and also seeks to sensitize young audiences to the wonders and complexities of high quality music. To achieve these aims, actor activities are structured into three axes of research, dealing with the analysis and uh, uh, technological tool development, as well as innovative outputs in the domains of pedagogy, music scholarship, and uh, compositional innovation. The core project actually comes out of uh, three of these, uh, uh, out in outputs, the innovative outputs, and then feeds back into the analysis, uh, as you'll see in some of the uh, subsequent uh, talks in this series here. I'll talk about the first round of the core project. Um, I'll talk about the project aims, the different approaches of the five universities, the various outputs that came from these things in the first round, the reactions of the participants, composers and performers, and then uh, some future directions that the project will be taking. A pilot version of the project was initially conducted at UBC in 2018-19, and the other universities uh, had their ensembles in 2019-2020 uh, academic year. Um, one of the main aims was to introduce considerations of perception and cognition into creative thinking about orchestration, including perceptual results of orchestration practice, particularly as concerns timbre perception, a taxonomy of auditory grouping processes that operate in orchestration perception, concepts and terminology from acoustics, perception, and cognition that might be relevant, as well as uh, Lassatorison's oral sonology framework for analyzing music as heard. Another aim was to analyze representative 20th and 21st century repertoire in terms of these concepts, as well as to track the creative and intellectual process in the interaction between composers and performers and to evaluate and adjust the usefulness of psychological concepts uh, in this case. Um, the method involved creating an opportunity for stimulating interaction between composers and performers in orchestration, problem solving, and musical creation and interpretation for the same ensemble in all institutions. The chosen ensemble included violin, bass clarinet, trombone, and vibraphone, plus small percussion, although small was interpreted differently across institutions, including such things as bass drum and tam-tam. Uh, this is a timbrely heterogeneous ensemble with one instrument per family, woodwind, brass, string, and percussion, which poses interesting challenges for the blending of instruments, for creating seamless transitions between instruments, and for maintaining equilibrium and balance across instruments. It was therefore a perfect test case for a ped pedagogical venture in posing and solving problems in orchestration practice. A common recording protocol used across all institutions was designed by Martha De Francisco in collaboration with the team at UC San Diego to work optimally in a variety of rooms of different sizes and room acoustics. It involves various spot microphones on the individual instruments, as you can see with the arrows here, an ORTF stereo pair to capture the ensemble and more distant mics for room ambience and so on. In all ensembles, there was an initial presentation of the goals of the actor partnership to situate the activity in the larger context. In some groups, the terminology and concepts of timbre and perception were introduced to ground the intellectual enterprise. At UC San Diego, the seminar participants also analyzed reference pieces in terms of uh, these various concepts. A notable feature was the presentation at the beginning of the seminar of seed ideas and initial aims by composers and or performers concerning their compositional proposal 
or ideas for different kinds of things that would be interesting to explore with the individual instruments and their combinations. And of course, the main activity was interactive workshops providing opportunity for exchange between composers and performers as the ideas began to develop. Initial video interviews were recorded with performers at McGill and the University of Montreal and with composers at McGill, the University of British Columbia, the University of Montreal and the University of Toronto. Exit videos were also recorded with performers and composers at McGill. Interviews at McGill and the University of Montreal were transcribed for text analysis, which you'll hear about in the presentation by Caroline Tolb. Several outputs were created depending on the university. Uh, there was a public reading session uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, shown here. Uh, recordings were done at the University of British Columbia and UC San Diego, and then only last May, uh, after the pandemic was starting to let up at McGill, and soon I think it will be happening at the University of Montreal as well. Oh, it already happened. Oh, good. <laughs> and there was a concert only at the University of British Columbia because concerts at the other institutions were not possible because of the pandemic, which shut things down a little bit early for our tastes. Uh, in some universities, participating musicians wrote reports on their experiences and aspirations and created annotated bibliographies on critical texts from which they drew for ideas and techniques. At UC San Diego, there was a critical analysis by composer Ioannis Mitsialis of the composer's pieces with respect to their initial intentions, and there was a follow-up seminar the next year in which the concepts, vocabulary, and definitions were evaluated, criticized, and amendments and potential applications were proposed in addition to providing relevant examples from the musical repertoire. Various methods were used in the creative process and for exploratory work by composers to communicate with performers, including sketches, diagrams, and graphics. Here's an example of a graphic sketch by Ramsey Sadaka at the University of British Columbia. Alex Blank and McGill created a table with verbal descriptions at particular points in times, with time going this way, and uh, he used this as a template for improvisation. It included for each of the four instruments, uh, specifications for pitch range, for example, middle low, some kind of texture, grainy, for example, dynamics, such as a crescendo from niente, uh, the timbre properties they wanted, such as dystonic, and a goal such as blend seamlessly with instrument number four, which is written here for instrument one number one. So they had to sort of read this and improvise based on these different properties. Joshua Buki at the University of Montreal went through various stages from graphics with verbal descriptions, play, uh, for example, play in choral ideal register, uh, play backwards, to non-pitch specific notation, uh, to a complete musical notation. Quentin Lovray at McGill presented sounds to be imitated collectively by instrumentalists, such as... And then later went on to musical notation, and you see an example of an initial sketch here. At UC, UC San Diego a seminar, there was discussion session on proposals for ideas for pieces and or etudes. And here's an example taken out of one of their sessions. So let's just start, uh, and this time we'll start with Sam. So the idea is to you know, talk a little bit about, again, maybe not summarizing the entire proposal, but where you are in terms of realizing its goals and what are particular difficulties or uh, surprises uh, have, have emerged, et cetera. So this was part of an effort to sort of track the creative process uh, and influence it as a group in the seminar. Um, oops, it skipped one. That's weird. Okay, um, here's, uh, I'm gonna play now a little bit of an early sketch by Pedro Mdiba at a joint exploratory session uh, of McGill and University of Montreal uh, people, which you can see in the picture here.
And oftentimes we would, uh, in a lot of different uh, situations would be recorded and then the performers and composers could listen to what was done the week before in order to uh, advance in their work uh, in following weeks. Okay, it's quick. Uh, many seminar and workshop sessions were recorded such as this rehearsal at the uh, University of British Columbia with Michael Duchamp. <laughs> Uh, what particular sorts of opportunities does this ensemble present to you in your role as a performer? Mm. I feel like the biggest thing is collaboration. Like, not only just, like, performer to composer, but just performer and performer. Like, this week we got to get together, and then for an hour and a half we just, like, played random sounds together, which was really cool, and we never get the chance to do that. So I think just, like, exploring what every possibility we have on our instruments and like what possibilities exist between the instruments and then also i guess between the composers and the performers it would be like having the chance to actually speak about what they want to hear come out of our instruments and like being able to talk about what's possible and what is not possible and like thinking of everything that we may not have previously like conceived of doing Okay, I'll briefly show some examples of the resulting scores, just to give you a visual taste of the diversity of styles. Here's one by uh, Jacques Zafra at UC San Diego, who is one of uh, 10 participating composers at UCSD. Uh, he uses microtones, vibrato, uh, combined singing and playing in the trombone, extended techniques such as spectral glissandi and the slap tongue. Uh, here's an example by Eliza Kramer, who we'll be talking a little bit later, uh, one of two composers at the University of Montreal, and he'll present more on his uh, work uh, in a moment. Uh, Pedro Mdiba was one of three composers at McGill using notation for tempo fluctuations, muting, and different bowing techniques. An analysis of the McGill composers will be presented uh, by Yuval Adler, Joshua Rosner, and Bob Hasegawa. Uh, Ramsey Sadaka was one of two composers at the University of British Columbia with notation presenting kind of some kind of pitch indeterminacy, focusing more on pitch gestures and things like that in his particular score. Uh, Tristan Zaba was one of five composers at the University of Toronto using various techniques of uh, violin bow placement, flutter tonguing, and rhythmic synchronies and asynchronies. As already mentioned, there were audio or audiovisual recordings of pieces, and here's an excerpt from the piece uh, Scenarios by Tianga Zhu at uh, UC San Diego that has some marvelous transforming uh, timbral blends. One question we were interested in was what performers and composers learned from each other in this interactive setting. Most felt that it was very successful in terms of the experience and collaborative involvement and appreciated having a significant period of time to explore the possibilities and limits of different instruments and their combinations. One of the main aims was to get the musicians to take into account processes involved in perception, memory, and attention by having them reflect explicitly on these things. This seemed to happen more explicitly in composers, but it implicitly affected the musical aims and tenor of methods adopted to achieve them in both performers and composers. A related interest was the degree to which the terminology and concepts from perceptual and cognitive psychology would be useful as tools for thought for the musicians. 
A critical evaluation of these revealed the need for some adjustments, reframing, and broadening in scope. Most participants felt that the terminology and concepts both helped evolve their thinking about orchestration and knowledge of the instruments and help make more conscious different phenomena that are usually dealt with intuitively. The word cloud here is derived from the evaluation report prepared by UCSD uh, this past fall, condensed into one picture. Uh, in round one of the prod, in round two of the project in 2123, we'll have expanded ensemble to seven instruments, adding flute, cello, and piano. Composers will have the possibility to use computer-aided orchestration platforms such as Orcidea, developed by Carmine Emanuele Cella at the University of California at Berkeley, who is also an actor member. And we'll also refine the score, recording, and text analysis procedures uh, based on their experience from the first round. Additionally, UCSD will delay their participation one year and run a pilot project with the same septet, but including electroacoustics and live electronics in a microphone configuration to be defined at UCSD with Martha De Francisco and Yingying Zhang next January. So I want to first of all thank all the collaborators from the different institutions, uh, myself and Guillaume Bourgogne and Martha De Francisco at McGill. Uh, Julie De Lille and Jason Noble were very active as the postdocs and actor at the time. Uh, Caroline Trobe, Pierre Michaud, and Jean Michael Lavoie at the University of Montreal. Keith Hamill and Bob Pritchard at the University of British Columbia. Roger Reynolds and Rand Steiger at UC San Diego, and then Elliot Britton at the University of Toronto. And of course, many thanks to the Canadian Science National Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, who's funding the actor partnership, and to our universities and all of our colleagues, and particularly all the students who participated in this project up to this point. We have a few minutes for questions. If we have some questions from the room, I would ask you to raise your hand and, and come up to the microphone at the back of the room to ask your question. And if there are questions coming off of Zoom, then Lindsay, our Zoom moderator, is going to read those into the microphone. So are there any questions from within the room or from Zoom? Not yet. Is that a question back there or no? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, so I'll get us started off. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, role of the composers and the performers um, and what they can learn from each other as part of the, uh, one of the goals of the core project. So I'm wondering if we, uh, where does the scholarly hat fit on, in that in terms of what, you know, can be, it can be the performer and the composer wearing the scholarly hat or say the music theorist or musicologist coming to it. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, what have we found so far uh, with the role of, of scholars as well as, you know, how does it mix in with performers and composers? Okay. I think we're actually thinking of that as having separate phases, uh, that the first is sort of a research creation phase between the composers and performers focusing on actually getting some music to happen. And then that creates all kinds of things like uh, written texts, interviews that are transcribed, recordings of all the sessions with dialogues and so on that are going on, the scores, sketches, all these things, which in a subsequent phase then are, are sort of handed over to the analysis team uh, who then began looking at some of these things. And we'll see a couple of examples of the music analysis by the next talk and then sort of interview uh, and text analysis in the talk after that. Right. Um, but then Eliezer can tell us how he feels that happened as did he have to have a, a scholarly hat at the same time as he had a composer hat or was it uh, just yeah. straight on research creation and so on. Yeah, very good, very good. Any other questions from in the room for right now? Anything from Zoom? Or well, in that case, rather than monopolize it, I think we'll just move on and then we will, um, we'll go ahead and have an extended discussion point uh, after, the, uh, after the conclusion of all of the uh, So our second paper is Documenting Composer-Performer Collaboration on Orchestrational Problem Solving by Yuval Adler, Robert Hasegawa, and Joshua Rosner. Yuval Adler is a researcher and composer currently completing his PhD studies at McGill University's Music Perception and Cognition Laboratory. His main research focuses on the perception and cognition of timbre and orchestration in contemporary musical practice, focusing on the ways composers use extended instrumental and notational techniques to achieve blended ensemble sonorities. 
Robert Hasegawa is Associate Professor of Music at McGill University. His research interests include spectral music, microtonality, psychoacoustics, and the history of music theory. Recent projects include studies of music by Gerard Grise, Tristan Morai, an article on atonal theory in the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, a chapter on extended just intonation for the volume, for the volume Theories de la Music, uh, excuse me, Theories de la Composition Musicale, or Bon Siècle, uh, and applications of transformational theory to the analysis of microtonal music by Hans Zender and Gerfried Haas. Joshua Rosner is currently pursuing his PhD in music theory at the Schubert School of Music at McGill. His research is primarily concerned with how listeners structure sound over time and the role that attention plays on, in grouping and segmentation. More specifically, his research as a music theorist focuses on how listeners hear form in contemporary chamber music that focuses on non-default instrumental playing techniques. I think we are set to go, so I'd like to welcome Rob Hasegal. Great. Thank you, Matt, and thanks everyone for being here or here with us virtually. My name is Robert Hasegawa, and I'll be the first speaker in this joint presentation. You'll hear from my co-authors Joshua Rosner and Yuval Adler in a few minutes. Our presentation, Documenting Composer-Performer Collaborations on Orchestrational Problem Solving, focuses on the addition of the core project, which took place at McGill in 2019 and 2020. As you've already heard in my colleague Stephen McAdams' introduction, the core project is part of the larger research program of ACTOR, a research partnership studying the analysis, creation, and teaching of orchestration. At McGill, as at the other participating universities, student composers wrote for a mixed quartet with fixed instrumentation. The four McGill performers were Jean Coté, violin, Brian Cass, trombone, Elia Foster, bass clarinet, and Martin Begg, percussion. And the three composers were Quentin Lovre, Pedram Diba, and Alexander Blank. In this short talk, Joshua Yuval and I will discuss how these composers and performers solved particular orchestrational problems with particular attention to issues of balance, blend, gesture, and the dialectic of notational specificity and freedom. I'll begin with a few case studies from Quentin Lovre's composition, For Narrow is the Door. In an October interview, relatively early in the project, Lovre comments on the particular challenges of the core quartet in terms of the complementary issues of balance, that is the audibility of each instrument in the ensemble, and blend, the perceptual fusion of multiple sonic sources into a single percept. Are we sharing computer sound for Zoom? Right. We are. I guess I'll have to probably stop sharing. Okay. Yes, someone remarked each individual sound is neutral. Is there Let's just turn the sound up on your machine. Could we Which sound not check a very good solution. this one, Andre, perhaps, just to see how this one is coming out? I have a you have an example in about up? five slides. I have an example if I can do that. Is that okay? It's a lot louder than the other examples. It's okay. Listen to people preparing their examples. You really got to crank <laughs> it up. You got to normalize it. You got to normalize it. Okay. Um, if that's okay, then I'll, I'll continue from there. Great. Okay. In an October interview, this was relatively early in the project. Kantan commented on the particular challenges of the core quartet. I think I've said this already. I'm going to pick up on this first point. In terms of balance, sorry, here we are. Yeah. In terms of balance, he observes that the biggest problems are the trombone and the vibraphone, which can easily swallow up the violin and cover up its sound. He observes that one of the solutions would be to change the spectrum of the trombone or the vibraphone through playing techniques, 
such as different mallets for the vibraphone and mutes for the trombone. Another way to avoid the problem is to separate the instruments into different registers and to ensure that the spectral energy of the trombone isn't in the same zone where the other instruments play. And finally, Lavray considers the role of the kinds of activity or gestures made by the instruments. If one gives different roles, different functions to the instruments, it's easier to separate them, to hear them in a clear way because they're doing different things. If the instruments all have a similar kind of activity, there is a much greater risk of fusion. So while Lovray talks about the risk of fusion in cases where the aesthetic goal is to keep the instruments separately audible, in other compositional situations, exactly such fusion or blend of instruments into a single sound can be highly desirable. When questioned about achieving blend between the four ensemble instruments, Lovray suggests that an easy and effective approach is to imagine a particular timbral territory and then seek to bring all the instruments together within that zone. He offers examples in which each instrument moves within its own timbral space toward a desired timbral territory, either sustained white noise or a tearing metallic sound, finally concluding that it's easier to think of the zone you're trying to reach and to see how the different instruments can meet each other in the same zones, rather than starting from nothing and saying, I'll try to make these blend. We'll now take a look at, and of course listen to, a few excerpts from Lovray's piece. Here, in measures 8 to 13, you'll hear the musical demonstration of some of the principles of balance and blend discussed above. I'm drawing here primarily on the perception-based taxonomy of orchestrational effects developed by Stephen McAdams and his collaborators. Let's hear this example again. Now, a few observations on balance, blend, and grouping. The initial rising gesture in measure eight encourages the gestural integration of the violin, trombone, and bass clarinet, even though they don't actually blend into a single indivisible percept. The brevity of the gesture and the shared rising trajectory, the gestalt principle of common fate, helps to group together the three distinct instruments. Next, the loud chord in measures 11 to 12 strikes a balance between audibility of individual instruments and a partial integration of the ensemble into a single sonority, though again, not a full and complete blend. The excessive dominance of the trombone and the chord is avoided through the various stated strategy of registral separation. The low register of the trombone keeps its most intense spectral energy far away from the higher violin and vibraphone. Furthermore, Lovray uses layer dynamics to keep the vibraphone appropriately balanced with the other instruments. It is marked only mezzo piano, but can still be heard clearly. In the score preface, the composer writes, even if it may seem unnatural or counterintuitive, following the layering of the dynamics is what will make the otherwise heterogeneous timbres merge. I'm pointing here to the um, fortissimos in the trombone and bass clarinet, mezzo piano in the vibraphone, and the fortississimo in the violin. And while these above strategies are largely aimed at maintaining the audibility of individual instruments, the ensemble is kept together to a degree by similar modes of articulation and sustain. The instruments come together in a shared timbral territory defined by roughness, granularity, and spectral complexity. With these observations in mind, let me play the excerpt once more. So this excerpt from a few measures later in the piece draws on similar orchestrational principles, the results are quite different. Noticeably, there's considerably more blending here than in the previous excerpt. Once more, a few observations. The motion-based gestural integration that marked the start of the previous excerpt is largely absent in this more static passage, 
we can speak instead of a textural integration with the four instruments combining into a single complex sustained texture. The gestural integration strongly linking violin and flex tone near the end of the excerpt is a rare exception amongst that descending glissando gesture. This time, the instruments share many common pitches, contributing to the increased perception of blend. These blends usually augment the timbre of the violin rather than creating a completely new emergent timbre. There are identical pitches linking violin and trombone, that's the G3, the G below middle C, and the violin and bass clarinet, G quarter sharp four, a little bit more than an octave above. The layer dynamics help to keep the violin at mezzo forte in the timbre foreground. The vibraphone is marked at just piano and the potentially problematic trombone is kept under control by the use of a harmon mute and then a shift to an unvoiced white noise breath effect, which easily merges with the breathy tones of the clarinet and the faint noise of the violin bow. Here the instruments again seem to seek a common timbral effect, an intersection of timbres that encourages hearing them as a single percept. The violin is at the center of this timbral territory with other instruments approaching its sound within their own timbral spaces. I'll play this excerpt, sorry, I'll play this excerpt once more to allow you to assess these observations and then I'll turn things over to my co-author Joshua Rosner. Thanks so much, Bob, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to continue our discussion by examining some of the features of Pedram Diba's composition, reaching for the unreachable point of desire. In his final, uh, excuse me, the core process was a departure from how Diba usually composes, planning, taking a step back to evaluate, writing, taking a step back again to evaluate and reassess, etc. The core composition afforded a more hands-on approach, putting an idea down on paper or expressing it verbally, exploring the sound with the ensemble, listening, spending time away from the ensemble, developing the idea, and coming back with a more refined version to explore. In his final report, Deba writes about the presentations on perceptual effects and the documentation of this process reveals their influence on this composition. Based off of the materials collected during the process and conversations with the composer, Deba achieves blend and cohesion using the following strategies, the Gestalt principle of proximity and similarity, the Gestalt principle of common fate, and by overloading the listener with sonic information. Let's listen to the beginning of reaching for the unreachable point of desire. Measure four is what I consider to be the principal gesture of this piece. It can be found throughout, but it first appears fragmented in measure one and more completely at measure four. Deba was significantly influenced by the Gestalt principles that he learned in the core class. And he references them in conversation and in many interviews. If we observe this gesture through a Gestalt lens, there are two principles at work, proximity and common fate. In regards to proximity and similarity, all of the instruments are playing in the range of roughly a diminished third between G sharp four and B flat four. Throughout the core compositions, composers were often able to group three out of the four instruments based on register, but there was frequently an outlier, usually, but not always violin. Keeping all of the instruments within a specific register, hovering around a single pitch, A4, groups them together. Deba's strategy does not require him to orchestrate any of the instruments in unison with one another. There is still an individuality to each instrument, each instrumental voice, yet their frequential proximity to one another helps the listener group them together. This is very much in keeping with Deba's original conception of this piece. In the seed idea presentation uh, in, of, 20, uh, excuse me, of September of 2019, he discusses striving for the instruments to make the same sound not as in the instruments are fused together, but rather a more heterogeneous entity. A listener hears the individual instrumental identities, but they, quote, belong to the same thing, end quote. 
After score study, the most complete version of this gesture occurs at measures 78 to 80. A conversation with Deba confirmed that this was actually the very first thing that he wrote for this piece. By the time a listener hears measure 78 80, to 80, they have heard variations of this gesture at measures 1, 4, 14 to 15, 24, 70, and 74. Not only is Deba utilizing innate gestalt principles to group musical material, he's also teaching the listener to group these heterogeneous timbres together. Even if a listener does not hear these similar but separate elements as a fused identity, they likely perceive them as inextricably intertwined. Let's listen. This brings us to the second strategy, the principle of common fate. Deba orchestrates a coordinated swell that helps create the impression of motion in the same direction among all instruments. It should be noted that the swell in this instrument instance is not only a grouping mechanism in the gestalt sense, but also a way to create an expansion of timbre. Especially by the end of the gesture, Deba has orchestrated the ensemble in such a way that the beginning of the gesture and the end of the gesture are timbrally distinct from one another, even though they're created from the same materials. Reflecting on the title of this piece, the upward trajectory at the end of measure 80 is the unreachable point, heard in the unstable tense violin dyad. This variation on the gesture with an upward trajectory is hinted at at measures 23 to 24, which we will hear now. The instruments collectively gesture upwards as high as possible, only to slowly fall in the following measure. The collective similar motion towards a common destination is a strategy employed by both Deba and Lavre. The last strategy Deba uses is that of cognitive overload. Deba, in almost a sound mass fashion, expressed the notion that chaos, to a certain extent, is a grouping mechanism. The chaotic internal motion of the composite gesture helps to create the perception of indeterminate sound sources. The overload is also in part assisted by the open notation that Deba employs throughout the piece. With the occasional exception of the bass clarinet and vibraphone, Deba chooses to notate this gesture in a loose fashion, giving the performers more agency than if he chose to be incredibly precise in this notation. The goal is to give enough information to get the desired sound while leaving enough room for the performers to shape their own artistic interpretation. This agency, I posit, encourages the performers to listen to one another, paying less attention to the score and internalizing the gesture, focusing on how to relate their part to the rest of the ensemble. My colleague Yuval Adler will continue this discussion. Great, just want to make sure that the camera is fine because now there's no one behind the camera. Um, yeah, so uh, I am Yuval. Uh, thank you for Bob and Josh for uh, going through all of that. Um, all right, so it's a little bigger. <laughs> Apologies. Okay, so um, to briefly recap, to briefly recap, there we go. Uh, here are some of the strategies for different types of instrumental integration and fusion that we can plausibly say are present in the examples reviewed so far. Uh, instrumental uh, blend with um, timbral augmentation and emergent timbre, textural integration, gestural integration, sequential integration, timbral shift, masking, timbral overlap, sound mass. So, um, I mean, these are all very, oh, come on. There we go. These are all very interesting, but the difficulty with everything we reviewed is that these sonic goals are plausible, um, but hard to, oh. <laughs> there we go, plausible. Um, Apologies for this. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, come on. There we go. Um, but hard to be certain about when we can't rely on reports, interviews, or session recordings to directly hear what the composer's intentions were, um, like Josh mentioned when he uh, spoke with uh, Pedram. Uh, so, what information uh, does an independent interpreter of this music have? And so, 
so did the composers in the seminar communicate their ideas and intentions to the performers? Uh, we can start to, how, how did they do that? We can start to tackle this by taking a look at the different approaches and notation we found uh, used in the seminar. Um, so the, the first sort of uh, approach that we, that we can see is sort of open and goal oriented um, kind of notation. So composers can sometimes write instructions that describe the sounds they wish to hear and that askew a uh, direct reference to instrumental technique, leaving it to the performers to realize the intended sound. This can be more or less specific, such as play a harsh loud sound or play a dark G4 uh, and blend with a trombone. Uh, these examples aren't directly from the scores, but one interesting example of this that came up uh, in the early exploration phase of the seminar was Lavrai's use of an audio score that Stephen mentioned and uh, played one of those examples for us. Uh, Deba's piece was perhaps the most open and goal-oriented of the pieces we reviewed here at McGill, uh, notating several gestures graphically. Uh, the other uh, approach is a more detailed and sort of uh, detail-oriented and, and controlled approach. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, you, this could be uh, done by uh, indicating the precise rhythm of a vibrato to be applied or indicating the exact fingering to use to achieve a specific clarinet multiphonic. As an example of such detail-oriented instructions, uh, Alexander Blank gave directions in his score uh, about ways to prepare clarinet reeds, uh, thinking to utilize the reed changes to achieve various uh, timbre uh, changes in the clarinet playing. Uh, and so this brings us to uh, the duality of music notation as being applicable, applicable to both music as heard and music as performed. And the simplest example being uh, guitar tablature notation describing the performed fingering and letting the sound uh, result from that, as opposed to writing the sounding pitches desired and letting the performer decide on their own fingering. Um, a lot of music notation falls somewhere in between um, uh, any of these uh, two, uh, either of these two extremes, with some combination of both types of information being presented. Uh, these considerations aren't new, but with the focus of our research on timbre and orchestration, some additional parameters arise, such as fusion and blend and integration, the traditional pitch-based notation uh, don't address well at all, and even current expanded musical practice can struggle with. One solution suggests itself in a similar way to how a melodic line for an instrument with an orchestral te texture might have solo indicated above, which suggests that the player should modify their sound production to stand out from the ensemble. A similar approach can be used for, the, uh, for other orchestral effects such as blend and fusion, but in order to do this, musicians need uh, to have some kind of agreed upon vocabulary um, uh, to describe these various orchestral effects. Uh, and so more on that in a little bit. Um, so this brings us to uh, the other materials collected at CORE to put these notational approaches in context. It should be noted that a thorough review of all the rehearsal recordings has not been completed for this presentation. Uh, and that a late completion of the final recordings as we heard from Stephen um, was, was only uh, not so long ago completed at McGill. Uh, I'll instead rely here on the later interviews conducted and the, uh, the later interviews within that year that were conducted um, and the last rehearsal sessions done towards the end of the seminar uh, last year before the pandemic interruption, uh, which brings me to the third piece that we suggested we'll analyze for this presentation. So um, although uh, that was our initial intent uh, at the time that we, um, that we delved into these, um, Alex was the least further along as far as the rehearsal recordings were. Um, since then, uh, these recordings have been completed, and so I, I would urge you to go to the, to the um, online uh, data repository and listen to these pieces in full. I will not play anything from Alex's piece, just because that's where, that's, uh, you know, based on the materials we had at the time, but it is, uh, it's a beautiful piece. <laughs> um, so, uh, sorry, jumping back into this. So, um, this does, thinking back to that year before we had this completed, um, these completed recordings, uh, the fact that Alex's um, um, rehearsals were the were the least far along. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I missed the uh, nope, not yet. Okay, was the least farthest along. Sorry, the the fact that this uh, piece was the least farthest along in rehearsals um, sort of brings up the 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 kind of the trade off that you have with detail oriented notation and um, and more open notation that relies on what's happening in the in the room, let's say. Um, which is to say that it just takes more time, kind of like how I'm taking a bit too much time here. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, 
let's let's see uh, sort of some of the like I said some of the other materials not necessarily score based uh, to talk about this issue. So we asked um, about notation in the interviews, um, and Alex described balancing uh, simplicity and specificity as nebulous, and he summarized the differences in approaches as notation adapting to the frame of the composer. Uh, when these issues were discussed with the performers, uh, I assign openness to different notation strategies. Um, the clarinetist for which Blank wrote the exacting read replacement instruction, Elia Foster, which we saw a little bit of her interview earlier, uh, seemed to appreciate both approaches. Um, she gave an example of a score that has a span in it with a simple instruction of insert grainy sound here as something both clear and engaging. Uh, at the same time, we asked whether she found any notation to be overly specific during their sessions, and she replied that uh, no, and the specificity and in instruction was useful. Um, and in rehearsal, um, I saw uh, frequent use of various terms learned in the seminar throughout the rehearsals um, to address uh, uh, timbral and orchestrational matters. When looking in the scores at those moments, we identified uh, in this presentation as suggestive of a certain orchestral effect uh, or another. It seems that vocabulary adopted by the musicians um, hasn't fully penetrated the notation practice so far as to include the terms in the score itself. Sort of thinking back to what I mentioned earlier about indicating solo above a line that you want to stick out. Um, notation was still relevant here. Uh, while there was no instruction on overall orchestral effect in Diba score, such as blend with, we believe the more open notation allowed the musicians to free up more attention to the shared aspects of their gesture um, and achieve more cohesion where relevant, even with a limited rehearsal time, uh, as Joshua mentioned previously. Um, so, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to, to the shared dictionary in a second, but just in before we conclude, I'd like to stress that the goal of our research was never to uh, prescribe how composers and interpreters should approach notation and orchestration. Instead, I'd like to frame the next few concluding thoughts as ideas uh, to add a shared collective toolbox of possible approaches. And so going back to what I said, one thing that could help is a, is a shared dictionary. So the main potential of, uh, oh, sorry, the main, the main potential of contribution to the, of the seminar to the students um, uh, to their practice with regards to communication of ideas was the ability to specify sonic goals and musical intent more directly using the vocabulary they learned. Whether this was used in a more open sonic goal oriented approach or to augment detailed performance instructions. Um, Alex gave a great couple of quotes uh, in his last interview that I think sum up some of the responses of the other particip participants, performers and composers quite well. Now that should come up. Um, so yeah. Uh, by giving the performers the same vocabulary as the composers, uh, we were all drawing from a similar dictionary. It allowed for more efficiency in expressing our various ideas. Uh, and so this was Alex when he was talking about um, the, introductory, the introductory lectures uh, in the seminar. And we need to have an agreed upon vocabulary before we can start pushing any of these parameters to their extremes or drawing everyone into the center of whatever map of sound we've created. Uh, uh, this was, I think, a remark specifically about oral sonology, but again, it was part of part of all of these topics that we covered during the, the seminar itself. So um, these taxonomies that were reviewed in that first uh, phase, without review of the full coding of the transcriptions that were done, although I think uh, my colleagues will talk a little bit more about that soon, um, I'll risk saying that the two taxonomies that were most widely adopted were the ones based on oral sonology and the ones suggested by our own Stephen McAdams. This is specifically sort of impressions from the materials that were reviewed at McGill. and so. It might not exactly match <laughs> uh, what the what the UDM team found. Uh, regardless of how um, the expanded vocabulary was utilized in each composer's case, it's apparent that it was of great utility to all the musicians. Um, and this brings me, so I mean, how can we build uh, on the positive reception of these vocabularies? Um, and one of the main deliverables of Actor um, is the online resource, the timbre and orchestration, <clears throat> sorry, the timbre and orchestration resource. Uh, so we can utilize the space um, in the future to present and explain these taxonomies, as well as offer proposed syllabus that could allow anyone to create a core like seminar for themselves. While there is no intent to evangelize one vocabulary or the other, these initial successes seem to suggest that sharing these conceptual tools could help others as well, regardless of which particular taxonomy they, they gravitate towards. Um, also feel free to check out what's already there on the tour site, uh, because there's a lot of neat things. there. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so if you have any questions, that's how to contact us, although I think we'll also be taking questions now. And uh, I think uh, I think that's that's it from the three of us. Maybe um, Joshua and Bob can come on up here if there are any questions and we can. <laughs> any questions?
questions from either Zoom or the floor tonight? Okay, we'll go to the microphone. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, it's been mentioned that the participation that participation in a project like core might change a composer's approach to writing a piece. How could this affect the results? That's interesting. Thanks, Pablo. It's a difficult question, I think. Um, I think any composer participating in any kind of collaboration or educational problem probably changes in some way in terms of their conceptions, their ideas, their experience. Hopefully that's a change that's better in some way, that's a maturation, that's a learning process. Um, I suppose that we really aren't running a controlled experiment in a certain sense, in that the composers are changing over time and learning things. And certainly um, the way that the core ideas were presented quite differently in every institution means the experiences aren't exactly comparable either. People had different degrees of exposure to different theories, different concepts, different amounts of rehearsal time. Um, while we have some standardized elements, there's really no, I think maybe no chance of absolutely standardizing everything when you're dealing with that many people. Any other? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that one of the really amazing things that that core does, although it's a little bit understated, um, orchestration is so traditionally taught based off of a study of instruments. And the idea that you're actually learning about it, thinking about orchestration through the eyes of a performer, a very specific human being that makes very individualistic sounds and then seeing whether or not they can transfer to other um, to other performers is a really interesting and fascinating way to approach this rather nebulous thing that people have been doing for a very long time without fully explaining it. I think that the biggest outcome, the biggest effect though, is that we now have 22 pieces for a really bizarre and wonderful ensemble. Um, so it's my hope that other people sort of see um, I don't know, I just what the, the benefits of grouping instruments that don't often get a chance to play with one another and take that as far as it can go with both Western orchestral instruments and also instruments that we all all too often don't even include in music research. Any other questions? Can you want to speak to that as well? Uh, I'll just mention briefly that, I mean, uh, it was mentioned that it's not a controlled experiment, but I guess uh, you can also look at this through one of the other kind of um, legs, as it were, of, of actor in general, which is research creation. And so, you know, it's not, this isn't supposed to be a snapshot of music creation out in the wild. It's also a, a bit of a push to, to get people thinking about things. So it's not, you know, I don't, um, I don't think there was a confusion on our side that this was supposed to be some kind of, uh, yeah, some kind of very clean and, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I could comment on that last point, the one about research creation, there were some really interesting things here that did come up through the interviews that weren't on anyone's agenda before. And I'm thinking particularly of this idea of gesture that Quentin talked about, and the idea that having people doing similar types of things, similar glissandi, similar types of motion, could play a big role in integration. And I think it's implicit in a lot of Stephen's grouping ideas, but it struck me that he phrased it in a different way. He thought about it in terms of gesture, which um, and composers use this term a lot, but for musicologists, it's still a slightly fuzzy concept, a card concept to understand. And I think this idea of um, gestural integration, which came partly out of Kenten's um, interviews, but also out of Pedram's approach that Joshua talked about, um, turned out to be really important. And I don't think that was something any of us foresaw. So to me, that's a nice sign that research creation, that methodology, is doing some work that people are discovering new ways of doing things through the doing of it, basically. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move us along to the next paper. I do actually have a question following up that, but I think it's going to tie together uh, many of the papers that are here. So I'm going to save it until the end. So you guys, you guys will get a question from me at the end of this. Um, 
our third paper today is um, orchestrational thinking and composer performer relationships in the context of a collaborative creation process by Justine Maillard, Caroline Cloud, Lindsay Remore, and Stephen McAdams. Justine Maillard is currently pursuing her master's degree in musicology at the University of Montreal. She holds degrees in neuroscience and has worked at the International Laboratory for, uh, for Brain, Music, and Sound Research. Lindsay Remore is a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University. Her research applies interdisciplinary methodologies using approaches from behavioral psychology, data analytics, and music cognition in combination with music analysis. Her research has been published in Psychomusicology, Frontiers in Psychology, Plus One, and Human Technology. Uh, the paper will be read by Carolyn Traub. Correct. Please welcome Carolyn. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks to Stephen and all the actor team uh, for organizing this symposium. So I'm going to present the results of the qualitative analysis of the verbal data collected through a series of interviews with composers and performers participating to the core project in the fall 2019 at McGill University and uh, at University of Montreal. The coding of the data was realized by Justine Maillard. Um, at the time, she was an undergraduate research assistant, uh, and uh, then she engaged in a musicology master's degree. And then now she's, she's in a, a, a speech disorder uh, program. So, um, so the, the project was, uh, uh, so the coding was, was done by Justine, and under my supervision, we consulted also with Stephen and, um, and uh, uh, also I want to, to mention that, so we are using the data, the verbal data collected through the interviews that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier. Um, uh, uh, so the series of questions at the time were, were conceived by Stephen, also the team of uh, postdoctoral researchers uh, were uh, at present at time, so Julie and, and Jason, Julie Delille and Jason Noble. Um, so, So you already know very well the core project at this time. Uh, the core uh, ensembles um, so had the same uh, heterogeneous instrumentations uh, in all institutions. So violin, bass clarinet, trombone, and vibraphone, plus small percussion. Just as a short reminder, so the, the, the aim of the project was to compose pieces for these ensembles in a collaborative way between composers and performers. So you remember also that there, are, there were five uh, phases uh, to the process, an initiation phase where the performers and composers uh, need to discuss their objectives, the exploration phase, um, and problem solving phases uh, where composers and performers experiment interactively to develop musical ideas and give feedback. The realization phase where uh, there is finalization and rehearsal of the composed piece. And finally, the dissemination phase where the pieces were uh, performed. Um, uh, and initially it was in concert we, 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 before public, but uh, it was finally just recorded. So the, the, the goal of the project, uh, the goal of this qualitative analysis was to shed light on two dimensions of uh, the, the data. First, uh, the participants' conception of timbre and orchestration with this particular instrumentation. And second, uh, the, the participants' vision of the collaborative process between composers and performers. In this presentation, I'll only discuss data collected at University of Montreal and at McGill University. But of course, this analysis could be extended to the other participating institutions. So data was collected um, by means of structured interviews with the core performers and performers. Uh, in total, there were eight performers and five composers. Um, 
that have been interviewed at Montreal and at UT Montreal and McGill University. The questions were oriented towards the participants' conception of tambourine orchestration with the instrumentation. Um, the uh, interviews were recorded, transcribed, and archived for subsequent analysis. So as Stephen presented uh, earlier, the questions were oriented towards uh, timbre resonance, blend, attack and sustain, segmentation of musical discourse, approaching collaborative work, uh, among other topics. Uh, just, just to give you an idea, uh, so in each interview included 11 questions. And to give you an idea of the, the content of these questions, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, read three, three of them. So um, first example, so what sounds produced with your own instruments could be made to blend together into new sonorities with the other instruments of the ensemble? So this was a question um, asked to a performer. Um, another question, consider situations in which the instrument starts together and one plays for a short duration and the other continues beyond. What sustained sound from these three other instruments could serve as an extended timbral resonance of a short note played on your instrument? And as in the last example, what specific challenges does this exam, uh, ensemble pose to you as a performer? And um, do you have strategies in mind to deal with them? <clears throat> so the, the analysis methods uh, we adopted um, is a, a qualitative method based on uh, grounded theory. So grounded theory relies on a set of systematic uh, inductive methods to conduct qualitative research that aims to develop a theory. These methods um, uh, include uh, six main, uh, let me see, yeah. uh, yes, I don't have the list here, but it's, it's okay. Uh, this method includes six uh, uh, stages. First, the codification, which consists in labeling all the elements present in the initial corpus. So the, analysis, the analyst assigns a code to each verbatim segment, thus attributing a significant evocative attribute to each portion of the verbal data. I don't know if you see at the top of the, the um, uh, image, image here, you have a screenshot here of the NVivo software, and you can see the different categories that were um, the, so uh, de determined. And so um, you can select uh, an excerpt in the data and assign it to a node in the coding tree. So, uh, so after codification, so categorizing uh, is where the most important aspect of the phenomenon under study being begin to be named. Uh, then linking is the stage where the analysts really, um, uh, yeah, linking is the stage where the analyst uh, links the, the data to the, to the different uh, nodes. Integration is the central moment where the essential of the subject is, is identified. Um, uh, and finally, the theorization consists in an attempt to, conduct, to construct in a meticulous and exhaustive way the multidimensionality of the studied phenomena. So in summary, we start from raw data and codify it. And from this multiplicity of codes emerges hierarchical categories that can be related and integrated to create concepts the, that can be then uh, theorized. Uh, so we used NVivo, the NVivo software. Qualitative, qualitative analysis can be performed uh, without this kind of software, but when you have a lot of verbal data, uh, it's hard to uh, work without uh, this, uh, this kind of tool. Um, so the NVivo software allows to quickly and efficiently obtain a code tree you know, for subsequent analysis. So um, as mentioned earlier, the questions were directed towards certain specific topics. So certain basic categories, which might be called parent categories, emerge quickly from the data. The two main categories are sound and musical parameters and the vision of the project and they are uh, counted in a multi multitude of subcategories. 
There is a visual representation of the coding tree uh, obtained in the category sound and music parameters. You can see that there are um, uh, four ma main subcategories, notation system, formal structure, harmony, temporal structure, and timbre, obviously. Considering the nature of the core project, the timbre subcategory is the most developed category. Throughout the coding process, we try to be as impartial as possible with the data following the principles of grounded theory. Uh, but a subcategory orchestration, you can see here, uh, was purposely divided according the, to the perceptual grouping processes uh, in orchestration developed by uh, Stephen McAdams and its uh, collaborators. It was obvious that the data followed these patterns and this was the best way to classify it. So um, according to this taxonomy, there are three types of perceptual perceptual groupings that we found in the data that really emerge as important categories, concurrent grouping, uh, referring to perceptual fusion and formation of sound events, sequential grouping, referring to connection of sound events into continuous streams, seg and segmental uh, grouping, referring to grouping of pieces of sound events into perceptual units. Um, so, uh, uh, NVivo uh, allows to um, uh, uh, perform um, um, uh, analysis, particular analysis of data. For example, you can use uh, a tool called the matrix coding query, which allows to observe patterns and recurrent thematic associations in the data. So matrix coding query was run to reveal the thematic associations between certain categories. And uh, we have five references coded as, at the intersection of Im imbalance and trombone, and 10 references at the intersection, inter intersection of violin and trombone. And this tells us that many mentioned these two topics simultaneously, and that uh, there is probably something to look for in these associations. Um, yeah, because so it's not exactly, let me see, yeah, um, I can't continue, yes, uh, sorry, because I don't have exactly the same slides, <laughs> it's okay, um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, a few words about, uh, again, sound and music parameters. Uh, while a thorough analysis of the data has yet to be done, uh, there are some of the most significant data that emerge from this main category at the moment. The, the most frequently addressed themes by composers and performers are timbre, extended techniques. This is in the, the first uh, rectangle here. Timbre extended techniques, timbral territories, blends, and spectral continuity. In the second uh, rectangle here, you can see the theme of uh, vibraphone and uh, spectral uh, continuity. In fact, the vibraphone was frequently identified and as an excellent instrument in terms of spectral continuity uh, to other instruments. Uh, this instrument is also highly associated with blend and timbral homogeneity. Third, third theme um, um, here. Uh, so in connection with the fragmentation of musical discourse, the themes of extended techniques and contrast were often raised. These themes were addressed simultaneously, particularly when seeking to create a break in a musical phrase or in a sustained note itself. Extended techniques were said to be a good way to create strong chamber contrasts that would achieve these, hands, these ends. Extended techniques are often combined with timbral territories, blends, spectral continuity, and uh, contrast. The fourth, the fourth uh, uh, theme here is violin and trombone. Uh, yeah, it was an int another interesting result um, that the violin and trombone were often mentioned together as a problematic combination, since the trombone is often associated with imbalance in loudness and register, 
this association can be assumed to be a contributing vector to the difficulties experienced in the instrumental duo. Indeed, the fear expressed is that the loudness level of the trombone, as well as the significant difference in register between the violin and the trombone, would contribute to a poor sound imbalance, causing the sound of the violin to disappear. Uh, last uh, theme here, um, imitation seems to be a key to achieving blend. It seems that for, for, for them, for composers and performers, getting as close as possible to the instrumental timbre, timbre of the other instruments is one of the most effective way to, to, ways to blend their sounds. One performer expressed it uh, in a very um, uh, precise way, in fact. Over the course of the rehearsals, each instrumentalist has developed his or her own techniques for getting closer to the sound of the other instruments in the ensemble or to their instrumental characteristics. So now uh, jumping to the vision of the project. Here is the coding tree uh, that emerged from the data. You can see that we deal mainly with uh, it's very close, very small, sorry about this, but we deal with uh, the attitude towards the project, the challenges, uh, the opportunities, and the relationship between composers and performers. In this collaborative process, the, um, the composers uh, greatly appreciated the almost immediate feedback from the performers. They appreciated being able to exchange with the performers and communicate their ideas more clearly. In addition, composers benefited from the performers' expertise with their instruments, and this seems to help the creative process greatly. The performers, uh, for their part, suggested that this collaborative process helped them to feel heard and valued. In addition, this uh, collaborative atmosphere has led to the development of collaboration, not only between performers and, and, and composers, but also between performers themselves. This was in fact mentioned in the excerpt of the interview um, um, played by, by Stephen earlier. Yeah, so, so um, the, the performers uh, explored new possibilities on their, on their own instruments, and, but also between instruments. This being said, almost all the performers who participated in the project expressed a certain uh, skepticism about the idea that such a collaboration, that such a collaborative project could dissolve the hierarchical dynamics between the two parties. In the words of many of the project participants, they believe that projects that emphasize composer-performer collaboration often fail to deliver. At the end of the day, the composer is seen as the one who brings and signs the score, and the performers are, remain just the performers. Nevertheless, there seemed to be a real hope among the participants that the core project will have to soften the barrier between composers and performers. These uh, preliminary results demonstrate that collaborative processes in music can have a real impact on the musical outcome of a piece. Composers and performers' perceptions of certain musical parameters and their sharing of them can influence the creative process. The core project reveals that supporting and developing collaborative creation processes um, allow to take performers' view into account and values their creativity. It also ensures that playing techniques are properly and efficiently notated on the score. It is often a frustration expressed by performers, you know, when they cannot interact with the composers and they're just puzzled by the particular notation that was chosen by the composer. So clearly this uh, collaborative process avoids uh, these communication um, uh, uh, obstacles. Also, it helps uh, sharing knowledge between artists with uh, complementary expertise. Everyone clearly benefits from each other's expertise in the process. It, it was well, it was really clear in the data from these interviews. And finally, it contributes to complex orchestration-related problem solving. 
Further analysis of the interviews will examine the evolution of orchestral thinking uh, from the perspectives of both composers and performers and analyze in more depth their collaborative dynamics in a problem solving situation. So we'd like to thank um, again, uh, all the student performers and composers who took part in this project at uh, University, uh, McGill University, uh, University of Montreal, as well as the faculty members, technicians and actor postdoctoral fellows, such as uh, uh, Jason Noble, Julie Delisle, and also Lindsay Rimor who took over on this project. And yeah, and they all supported this project in many ways. Um, uh, finally, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, Julie Maillard received a um, uh, uh, research internship scholarship from OECRM. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Put the mic. All right, thank you to the presentation. I have a question regarding the encoding tree. Right? Yeah. So how do you relate the answers from the performers and composers to the questions asked? So when you derive the, the data that, for yeah. example, people speak about blend. Yes. How is it connected to if the question wasn't like, what do you think of blend, for, for, for example? So it's not like, how do you not bias your questions? Oh, uh, yeah. So. So this is not about the coding itself, but how you ask the questions. I mean, uh, how is the data so not specifically connected to the questions you ask? Uh, in fact, they are. So the, the, these are the answers to the questions, right? And so the idea, so the coding, um, uh, so the way it works is that you go through the, the verbatim and uh, each time, for example, blend is mentioned. Uh, you associate this little excerpt to the, the node blend in your coding tree. And then, so this, so the, the software doesn't do the analysis for you, which it, it just helps you to um, easily retrieve all the, all the, the, uh, the times uh, the word blend was mentioned. Yeah, what I mean is, for example, to give a basic mm -hmm. example, if you ask someone, what do you think of blend? Yes. Then Everybody says, I think blend it. And so, okay, people say I'm thinking about blend, right? But that just says that they answer the question. What I mean is, uh, how do you disconnect the questions? I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah. I can possibly yeah. follow up a question yeah. on that, actually. Um, <coughs> and go right ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, please, even. <laughs> Merci, Louis Michel, for the, this question. Uh, Louis Michel, uh, two guys, actually, one of the composers in round two. Um, I think part of the question, I mean, one of the things, if I understand correctly, is that basically the analysis of the coding tree is taking all of the text across all the questions, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they're not specifically relating to the question, but you could, in fact, limit yes. the analysis to a question, and then they would be more directly related. To yes. But this approach is more generally is trying to pick up everything that's going on exactly. across all of the answers yeah. to all of the questions by everybody. You, you could right? do an analysis, uh, a coding tree for uh, each question uh, separately. But um, in fact, uh, there were some questions about uh, collaboration, you know, specific questions about that. But the, the, to the topic of the vision of the project uh, uh, came out in other questions, in, in the answers to, uh, to, to other questions. So in fact, you know, because, you know, you start with a question and then it can drift towards another topic. So this is why it's important to have um, an analysis that's really broad and then just takes the raw data from all questions together. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that, but I'm also just general announcement. When we go to the uh, microphone to ask a question, please state your name before asking your question. So in that vein, my name is Matthew Zeller. My question is, um, when you're coding for grounded theory, uh, how do you how do you decide upon which terms are going to be coded? What gets mm -hmm. coded? And do you go through different versions of that? Yeah. Do you go through different drafts of that? And yes. 
Yes. Yeah, that yeah. process. That process. Uh, yeah, so uh, Justine, um, it was interesting because Justine, uh, so she's a musician. She's uh, trained as a, uh, so she, she was doing her um, uh, the graduate degree in neuroscience, neurocognitive science. And she's, um, she's also a clarinetist, but she didn't know at the, at the beginning of the project, she didn't know about the actor project and she didn't know about the taxonomy and all the work done by Stephen. Uh, and, and I thought it would be good that she starts coding without that knowledge um, to have a very fresh and, and not a bias, you know, and not just, uh, you know, just reproducing predetermined de categories. And, um, and so I, 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 I interacted with her several, several stages of the process. And at some points, I showed her the, 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 the the classification, the taxonomy, and and we agreed that it was indeed the best way to organize. I mean, she was asking questions. Yeah, I found this connection between these these terms and so on, and and for her, it really uh, uh, was an enlightening. It, exactly, this is exactly what I needed to make sense of the data, right? But so because the grounded theory um, uh, recommends that you have. Uh, a very uh, a high neutrality you know you you shouldn't have a pre uh, conceived uh, a grid analysis grid and you should just go through and see what are the recurrent themes and 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 so yes and nvivo allows you to to build um, your uh, coding tree in a very progressive way and so i've i've been uh, uh, part of other projects uh, where we were five different people working on the tree and and so and we fought till we agreed, you know, <laughs> because every everybody has a, has a way of looking at the data, and at the end we were really we were really sure that it was the perfect. I mean, not the, not necessarily perfect, but clearly, if someone did did agree, it was because there was a problem, you know, somewhere, you know, and so so ideally, so um, so we were. Uh, so Justine did most of the coding uh, work. And so I, I also looked at the data with her, but ideally you have several coders who um, code independently at first the, 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 the data so that you have this neutrality again, you know, and, uh, and then at some point you try to, to make uh, the coding converge into something, um, yeah, okay. final. Um I'm going to talk to you in more detail about that <laughs> yeah. later because I'm starting yeah. to work with Grand okay. Theory as well. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I think we, for time's sake, we better wrap up and move on to our fourth presentation. And then we'll probably have time for some discussion at the end. I think right. a lot of us would love to revisit this. All right. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Our final paper today uh, is by Eliezer Kramer titled E Rock creating blends, combining styles, and composing through collaboration. Eliezer Kramer is uh, pursuing his doctorate in composition at the University of Montreal. He holds degrees from the Musikhochschulen in Patea, Sweden, and from the University of Gothenburg. His uh, works have been performed in Canada, the USA, Sweden, Japan, Cyprus, Turkey, and Finland. Please welcome Eliezer. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to talk about my piece because the core project was such a formative experience for me. Um, I'm going to do my best not to repeat things that you've already heard today, but please forgive me if I do. I'm going to talk about my role as a composer in the core project. And uh, I'm going to give examples of how concepts on timbre and orchestration that were explored in the core project manifested themselves in my composition, E-Rock. I'll talk um, about some of the concerns I had about writing for a heterogeneous ensemble my approach to creating blend in the ensemble, and finally, the influence of performer-composer collaboration on my piece. Uh, so you already know that the core groups consisted of 
composers and uh, performers across universities of, uh, in North America. Uh, we were introduced to concepts related to timbre um, and orchestration through presentations on oral sonology, timbre semantics, and perceptual grouping processes and orchestration. For the student participants, the core project was essentially a seminar, and uh, we had many in-class discussions about this stuff as well. Within these uh, presentations and our discussion, there was a lot of emphasis put on achieving blend. And so it seemed that this was to be an important focus of our composition. Um, and ooh. <laughs> each composition was to be eight to 10 minutes in length and there were no stylistic restrictions. So is there any way to scroll down on the notes? But. If you put your mouse over here, okay. Put the mouse over here. Oh, yeah, thank yeah, you. Right there. There. Okay, great. Um, I'll now give an overview of the calendar of the core project. At least. Oh my God. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to give an overview of the core project from my perspective as a student. Um, in the introductory phase of the project, we attended lectures on timbre and orchestration. Composers and performers were asked to present seed ideas on uh, the compositions that they would eventually write. This was a difficult task for me because I'd been introduced to so many different concepts, so I, I didn't really know where to start. But if I remember correctly, I talked about the possibility of using the ensemble as one instrument and also imitating instruments within the ensemble in order to achieve blend. Parallel to this was the first workshop at the University of Montreal, in which we explored different ways of achieving blend. After this, uh, at McGill, we uh, workshopped with performers, and the performers also presented on their instruments, and they talked about different ways that they would try to achieve blend in the ensemble if, uh, if they were composing a piece, and that was quite interesting interesting for us. I did forget to mention that I attended uh, workshops at McGill and at University of Montreal. So this is why you're seeing both of these, both of these things. Um, following this, we continue to experiment with different textures and sound gestures. Uh, and then composers uh, towards the end of the semester were asked to write a short paper discussing what they would explore in their compositions. And in my case, the composition that I proposed was completely different from the one that I would write. We don't talk about that composition anymore. Um, this was followed by the second workshop with Iraq, uh, the Iraq Ensemble, where we explored uh, blend once again. Beginning of the new year, I began composing my piece with much difficulty. Towards uh, halfway through January, I started composing Iraq. This was followed by the third workshop at the University of Montreal, where we workshopped the first half of the piece. I then finished Iraq with the first draft of it, and we uh, rehearsed the final uh, half of the piece at the final workshop with the Eroc Ensemble. And then we all know what happened after that. So the lectures and in-class discussions filled me with questions and concerns even before I started composing. Some of these uh, influenced Iraq quite a bit, while others I simply abandoned. The first issue, and the one that we seem to be expected to reflect on most was, how do we make such a heterogeneous ensemble sound homogenous? A rather basic question I had was, what is blend? Uh, although I felt that I understood what it was intuitively, I never really reflected on it. And I was curious about the different approaches uh, one could take with this ensemble. A rather large preoccupation of mine uh, was how to use timbre as the primary element of a piece. I was introduced to this in the core uh, seminar and I was quite overwhelmed by it. It was the source of many sleepless nights. So how can you use, similarly, how can you use timbre to define a piece's structure? Like all the other composers, I was concerned about balance issues with the ensemble. In particular, uh, I was worried that the trombone would always dominate in louder passages. 
And finally, I was concerned that there'd be a certain monotony in the voicing because the oh, oops, the V's would technically be on top and the trombone and bass clarinet would be on bottom. Spoiler alert, I stopped worrying about that when I began composing the piece. Um, as you can see, the whirlpool eating up my concerns. Um, balance issues are generally a cause of poor orchestration. And so there seemed to be a rather straightforward approach to dealing with that. Finally, using timbre to define a piece's structure was a bit too radical of a change for me. And so I gave that up, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, uh, many passages in E-Rock were uh, inspired by, by achieving blend and timbre. Uh, and blend was used as the guiding uh, musical force. The emphasis on blend and the self-imposed expectation to highlight blend at every moment of the piece made me feel lost and unable to compose. I eventually decided to, to deal with the heterogeneous nature of the ensemble by unifying it. It struck me that several of the ensemble's instruments are used in klezmer music. And so I decided to draw on that style as inspiration for E-Rock. I don't know what's happening here. Oh, okay. I had such a wonderful transition plan. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Okay. And it struck me that several of the ensemble's instruments are used in klezmer music. <laughs> For instance, the violin and clarinet are staples of klezmer music. Excuse me, sound here. Um, sorry. Brass instruments and the snare drum are often present in plasma bands. And the vibraphone, a keyboard instrument, can take on the role of the accordion or piano. Jazz is another musical style that lends itself well to this ensemble. For instance, trombone, the snare drum, and cymbal are very common in jazz. Bass clarinet can take on the role of a saxophone or just as a The vibraphone, once again, can take on the role of the piano. Although writing in these styles didn't really mean that there would be homogeneity or blend, uh, doing so seemed to deal with the issue of heterogeneity by offering um, a form of cultural blend or syncretism, a way of unifying the ensemble. Most of the passages in E-Rock resulted from some form of reflection on blend, simple or otherwise. For instance, how did the instruments blend while playing in the same absolute register? The following example is of the violin, trombone, and bass clarinet doing just that. Uh, another simple question I had was, how do the violin, bass, clarinet, and trombone blend while playing in three different octaves? I was curious whether one could perceive uh, blend or timbral continuity through analogous gestures regardless of their timbre. For instance, if we have a glissando on the violin and a harmonic glissando on the bass clarinet. Or pitch bending in different instruments. Finally, uh, go back to my idea of treating the ensemble as one instrument. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines blend as to mingle intimately or unobtrusively and to combine into an integrated whole. While this definition certainly doesn't uh, cover all the aspects of blend in relationship to music, it seems like a sufficient way to describe what I tried to do in E-Rock. 
Of course, blend refers to the vertical relation between timbres. However, much of what I try to do in EROC involves timbral continuity or the horizontal relationship of timbre. It seemed like an obvious way to render the ensemble more homogenous was by imitating instruments within the ensemble. For instance, in the following example, the bass clarinet tries to imitate the violin's pizzicato by playing poco slap. In a solo passage following a duo between the clarinet and percussion, the clarinetist imitates the snare drum and the hi-hat by beatboxing. I tried to achieve blend by using analogous timbres or sounds of similar qualities, for instance, grainy, metallic, and airy. Uh, this was inspired by oral sonology and timbre semantics, some of the subjects that we were introduced to in the core seminar. The following example, I use air noise, multi-timbral trills, violin harmonics, and the cymbal and vibraphone played with the bow because I considered all these to have airy qualities. Similarly, I found that in loud passages, the trump when the trombone played with the harmon mute, it blended well with the vibraphone and the double stops in the violins uh, on the violins lower strings because of their shared grainy and. <laughs> found that a rather simple way to achieve blend was by using complementing registers. By complementing registers, I just mean registers in which the instruments share timbre qualities. In this next example, the, uh, it's very simple. The clarinet and the trombone play B4s uh, and uh, B above middle C, and I find they sound similar. I already uh, mentioned using the ensemble as one instrument as a way to combine into an integrated whole. And to do this, I had all the instruments perform a similar gesture uh, in hopes that the combination of their timbres would result in a new one. And although I'm not really sure that I can say I achieved blend in this example, well, I'm not sure if I can say I achieved blend in any example, but um, here's an example uh, at the end of EROC in which uh, I tried to do this. So I tried to simulate distortion by having all the instruments play a crescendo in an increasingly dystonic gesture. Uh, and then there's a sudden shift in dynamic as if to suggest a speaker bursting, at least that was the inspiration of it, to sort of suggest that the instruments can no longer produce noise. <laughs> Finally, uh, I mentioned that one can create the perception of a whole by exploring different styles in which uh, these instruments may find their homes, so klezmer, jazz, whatever defines my style. Uh, 
Um, these are all examples of how the core project inspired me to to write. It's not that I I never necessarily think I you know I I, I achieved it there, but it's just uh, everything that we looked at in the core project was an inspiration. So hopefully those examples kind of showed why. Lastly, or almost lastly, I'm going to discuss the collaborative aspect of the core project because it had a significant influence on my piece. It was extremely helpful to attend the musician's presentations in which they showed the composers extended techniques and ways that they thought uh, that they would achieve, they could achieve blend with the ensemble. Uh, in general, however, it seemed like the musicians were uncomfortable with making suggestions unless they were provided with music. On my end, it felt strange to ask them to create blend or experiment or improvise purely by verbal description. During the workshops, uh, I provided them with short passages to experiment with blend. However, it was a bit awkward to work on material outside the context of a piece because it sort of felt like I was experimenting with, in, with blend uh, inside a vacuum. And that's not a very realistic or inspiring context to work in. Um, and this led me to stop experimenting and to write E-Rock as quickly as I could. Ultimately, <laughs> this meant, well, I, I still did a lot of the other stuff, but you have to make a decision at a point. Um, ultimately, this meant we would workshop E-Rock rather than co-create it. This approach um, allowed for some experimentation uh, with different sound combinations, and it inevitably resulted in passages inspired by the uh, performer's feedback. Having said that, an issue with using a concrete score is that the musicians only offered suggestions uh, based on sounds and textures that I had already decided on. Perhaps a more beneficial approach uh, for the purposes of the core project would have been to provide the musicians with scores that were a combination of notated music and written guidelines for improvisation. As I say that, I realize that Stephen showed examples of composers that were in my group doing that. So shame on me. Um, in both of my approaches to the core project, I was struck with a heavy case of composer's guilt. On the one hand, uh, it felt that by asking the musicians to create without a detailed score, I was asking them to do my job for me. On the other hand, asking for feet, uh, 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 yeah, asking for feedback on a detailed score felt as though the performers were just there to do favors for me. In all honesty, I'm not sure what the best approach would have been to take with the ensemble. As a composer, I often have the sense of composer's guilt because I feel as though I owe something to the musicians that are performing my piece. And I don't think that's unreasonable because if you're writing instrumental music, it only comes to life when other people perform it. Um, in cases like the core project, however, where composers and performers are supposed to collaborate on a piece from its conception to its completion, it becomes quite difficult because we're so used to this, used to this hierarchical way of thinking. The irony is that I imagine the performers felt the same way and that they didn't want to overstep any boundaries by offering me suggestions. To uh, sum up, E-Rock explores different styles of music to unify its heterogeneous ensemble, uses a mix of traditional and contemporary writing. Gestures centered on timbre and blend tend to involve a more contemporary style. However, considerations about blend and timbre went into almost every measure of the piece. Um, many of the passages centered on blend uh, were inspired by oral synology and timbre semantics. Lastly, collaborating with musicians had a really large impact on the piece, but left questions open as to how to best approach future collaborations. I will thank uh, the performers of my piece, uh, Jean-Michel Lavoie, who conducted it, Mathieu Berini, violin, Zachary Fournier-Robert on trombone, Charlotte Liec on bass clarinet, and Alexandre Duchamp, microphone and small percussion, and uh, the video extract uh, example you saw was from Jeremy Martineau, Thierry Jamy, Samuel uh, Bobonny, Mathieu Arsenault, 
with the audio by Pierre Michaud. Thank you also to Stephen and Caroline uh, for having me and everyone else in the actor project. Great. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, please go to the microphone. State your name first, and then go ahead and fire away. Guillaume Bourgogne. Um, where did you read or hear that uh, blend had to be the focal po point of a core? It was probably um, just something I imagined. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's that it's not that anyone ever explicitly said it because I I think we even had a similar conversation when we worked on the project. It's just we we focused so much on blend, and uh, and that's not. That wasn't a, I didn't mean anything negative by it, but it's just that it was a new concept for me. So it was one that I wanted to really work on. Um, and so it was self-imposed, I think. And I also just also by seeing the work that other people did from other universities and other composers, I felt like, uh, like everything was blending and, uh, and it just seemed like that was the direction to go, but no one, no one said you have to do this. Uh, I'm asking because I think there is a, some kind of misunderstanding there, uh, not on your end, but uh, maybe uh, in a more general way in the core. Uh, I'm sometimes I fear that the blend is the the, the main pre pre preoccupation of uh, some composers or or even uh, researchers. So just asking. <laughs> no, but, but I but on the other hand, it it really uh, made me think about writing in a different way. So it, it was po a positive uh, thing to have that focus on it. I just, I just had to give up certain expectations I had of myself. Super. Thanks so much, Elias. I'm Joshua Rosner, by the way, if you don't remember from earlier. Um, I, I so appreciate the way that you really unpack the entire experience. So I just wanna get that out of the way the beginning it's really very thoughtful and really appreciate it um i'm really curious if you could talk a little bit about notation specificity um i think that some of this may be tied up in what you're calling composer's guilt but i'm curious if you thought about the best ways to get the sounds that you wanted and if it was easier to do that if you were more specific or more open I think for any passages in the piece that would require some kind of complex notation, and there's only a few of them, maybe if you'd even call it complex. I think the um, I think what helped most was discussing with the, you know, talking to the performers and saying this is sort of my idea, and and but first giving them my attempt at it, and say this is what I kind of want to do. Do you have any suggestions of how? You know, we can maybe make this better. When they tried it, um, I asked, uh, you know, and said, "Oh, this isn't really working." So they made suggestions. I said, "Okay, if it wasn't clear, how would you write that in the score?" So there was discussion with the performers about how to best uh, notate things. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it is six thirty, and we have reached our time. I do think that uh, we can continue the discussion more informally. Uh, but that is the end of the of the, the formal symposium. Um, I'd like to thank everybody involved. I'd like to thank everyone involved in the core project, everyone actor, confirmant, and all of our presenters. Keep giving it a round of applause for them.